So we're now no longer confirming, we're playing and experimenting with our model and of course it's no longer truly confirmatory because we're tweaking it, we're changing our original design but because we're trying to improve fit because we know people will not like it to publish it or review it or examine it if it's a bad fit. Clearly, as I've said before, items that are not statistically significant could be dropped, covariances that are not statistically significant could be dropped, but whatever you do, you check for what does it mean if I take this item away? What does it mean if I take away this relationship? Is it theoretically integral? So again, you can go back to the modification indices command and get the modification indices and you're going to tell it Shown me only the big ones. And this is what you can get. And remember the MI and the standardized expected parameter change. I've highlighted both. Notice only one Ida, one relationship comes out super strong, and that's that TI4 is correlated with TI5. We saw that before yesterday. And so you could say, well, maybe I should just kill one of those items and then rerun everything and go, does my fit improve a lot? Okay, I wouldn't recommend adding that correlation. I'd recommend deleting the need for the correlation. So, fix the first. So, something you can do this afternoon is go back to this invariance model and before I start playing with it, I would do the CFI comparisons. Don't trust the chi-square comparison, which said, eh, go back to the CFI comparisons. But you could also play with, fix that problem with TI4 and TI5, and see what you get. Um, I want to go on to the late growth modeling, so while your still brain is still kind of fresh for the day, so we get the next content before we go into practice and play. And this is the last content lecture of the course, so everyone should go, yay! <laughs> Reset. Latent curve analysis. Sometimes called latent growth modeling, sometimes called latent curve analysis. <coughs> Remember when we're looking at reciprocal or circular relationships, we can't put them in a structural equation model. We can't put them in a path model because it violates the rules. But if you've created a longitudinal model, you could look at the effect of how A, a influences C and how C influences A if you could track people over time. Or you could say, well, I have test one of A, and I have a separate test of A, and I'm going to run one at the beginning and give them B and C, and then the second test that I have equated, then you maybe could get away with a circular reciprocal relationship diagram. You could simply do, and this is what a number of my doc students do, is an experiment, quasi-experimental study, where at time one, group one gets A, and time, time two gets B, and then we swap them so that no one feels deprived. But if that's, if B is better than A, why are you not giving me B? You're going to get B and A, and you're going to get B and A, and we're going to evaluate the effect. And so you can see whether, if A is better, is it always better first and second than B? Okay, so you can see whether or not it works. And a number of my students have done this kind of design because it's easier to get ethics approval if you say everybody's going to get everything. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not depriving people of the one I think is better. Okay, so it's difficult in social circles, social studies, social sciences research to do the random control trial design if people 
don't want to uh, let you allow somebody not to get the thing you think works better. And if you're a single researcher design, where the researcher is doing everything, it's, you can't have a double blind. But if you have a team, you can run a double blind. So for example, in a study that I did with Lois Harris, I selected candidates for an interview study out of a pool of people whose scores I knew, but she didn't know their scores. And she didn't know why I had selected them. And so she interviewed them, and then we compared the interview results with the survey results. So in a sense, it was uh, at least a double-blind investigation, because the people who were interviewed didn't know why they'd been selected, and the interviewer didn't know why they had been selected. But if I had known and done the interviews, you would have lost that. I would have influenced them to tell me what I told, thought they should say. Right. The linear path model, we've looked at this before. It's a way to do time-based repeated measures. You create a theory-driven design, but it keeps good thing, it makes everything manifest, it keeps the residuals, it keeps the correlations, it can keep moderation, and it's good with low end, but it's not the same as the repeated measures in a latent curve model. In a Clayton, Clayton curve model, what we're saying is there are two invisible factors that influence responses. The first factor that influences how you respond is how you start. So your first answer is your anchor point. If you remember the work by Amos Tversky and Tversky's work is all about heuristics and biases. And people, when you're negotiating price, the person who says the first price creates an anchor and other people negotiate around that anchor. So when you're in China, don't ask how much. Say, I'll give you 10. <laughs> You've created an anchor. And they negotiate around your anchor. Or you do very brutal, like my wife. He says 800, she says, no, 200. And he says, 500. No, he said 600, she said 200. 500, she said 200. Oh, okay, we walked away. Then she said, here's 200, go back. Show him the money. So I go back, and he says, 400. I said, no, 200. He says, 300. I said, no, 200. No, 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 no. Okay, bye. Oh, okay, come back, come back, come back. <laughs> anchor. Everyone has an anchor. They're how they start anchors their answers from then on. You deviate from your anchor. So your first answer in a repeated measure study influences how you answer everything. But, because life happens, things happen, experiments happen, or events in society happen, you change. Now some people are very unstable. They're very changeable. The weather's raining, oh, yeah. the weather's sunny, yeah. <laughs> Other people are much more stable. They don't change so much. It's also true that if you start near the top, it's hard to go up. It's easier to go down. If you start near the bottom, it's almost impossible to get any worse. But you can go up. So this ceiling and floor effect uh, limit how much change you have. So when you want to do a repeated measure study, you have to make sure that the ceiling is really high so people aren't bumping into it, and the floor is really low so people don't bump into that which is uh, an interesting design, a problem for um, test developers because you have to think about how to create a test that's close to where they are but not so easy that everyone is at the top and not so hard that everyone is at the bottom. And that's why we have this thing called computer adaptive testing so the difficulty keeps shifting 
as people's ability changes. So it's really important to have a scale that's long at either end without putting everybody on the middle. And that's one of the problems with the Likert scale, any Likert scale. It's only two positive and only two negative. If you start with a four, there's not much room for you to improve. There's no way to show if you become more agreeable without becoming strongly agree. And likewise at the bottom, it's a limited limitation. So presumably everybody is influenced by their own starting point and their own tendency to change. So in latent growth modeling, obviously, we can set the parameter for the starting point to be equal across time. Because there's only one starting point. The starting point is a constant. And of course, your tendency to change has to be zero at the beginning because there's no space for change. This was your baseline. So there is no changeability at time one. And what we tend to do with changeability is index it to the amount of time between measures. So the change indicator is a ordinal, well it's actually continuous, but it's categorical in the sense of this is two days, this is four days, this is six days, if we do it every second day. Or it could be this is two hours, this is four hours, this is six hours, depending on. If we actually have a random reinforcement schedule, like we send a prompt to someone who's trying to quit smoking to their phone on a random cycle, we could anchor the time on how many minutes it was since the last data sample. Okay? So we use the, the change variable to indicate the ch time change the change in time. Does change in time explain your answers? Or does your start point change your end? Just explain your answers. The hopefully change over time is linear, but it isn't always. Bad things happen sometimes. Sometimes change is bing and then or it goes down and then it goes back up and change, especially depending on what you're measuring, like something very unstable inherently could change in very strange ways. It might not change in a con a easily predicted shape. So latent growth curves or growth curve models are have these fancy background statistics. But this is the fundamentals here. Here's my measure time one, time zero, time one, time two, time three. And the intercept is constant. It's set up to be constant across time. And my changeability has to be zero at the beginning. And then here's my first unit of time, the second unit of time, and the third unit of time. And these two are correlated. If you start high, you probably can't change except down. If you start low, you probably can't change unless it's up. So there's oftentimes an inverse relationship here. That's what the formulas look like. Fortunately, you and I don't need to know about that. Um, but we need to understand the logic of what we're doing. Um, often we'll measure this with maximum likelihood modeling and we treat the time as categorical and the interactions with time and we assume that variance is variable and the intercepts and slopes as outcomes type of thinking. So we're interested in knowing what's your beginning point and what's your changeability over time. And this is what Levan does. My model is equal to the intercept, this construct, is equal to a regression of 1 on time on y0, a regression of 1 on y1, a regression of 1 on y2, a regression of 1 on y3. So you're fixing it to be constant and equal. And time, or the slope, I, I might call it time, 
is zero on time one. One on time one, two on time two, three on time three. And time, the variance is zero, the intercept is zero, and there's the residuals. This is a cluster covariant if you say, well, I want to know if uh, some other variable influences your starting point. For example, sex, or grade, or inter um, ethnicity, some categorical variable, you could build that in to the intercept. And you can see why writing all of this in Amos is so much more fun because you can draw this picture and then you can say this thing might influence the starting point. Or it could be the... Or you could say, well that thing influences both things simultaneously. And it varies. There's something else that happens over time that you can build into the model. So you can do a lot of fancy stuff. There's the code for that. There's the picture. When you can see the picture, you begin, I feel like I begin to understand what's going on. And the interaction, very fancy. Here's a model that I've, I sort of know something about. We administered this questionnaire. It had three factors. Sorry, no. The questionnaire has four factors. And I had to reduce it to manifest variables. Because I only had 80-something people at time one and 80-something people, sorry, 80-something people in group one who did it three times. And 80-something people, the second cohort, who did it three times. So I can estimate this four factors at any one time with... 80 to 100 people, but as soon as I want to have 24 items times 24 items times 24 items with only 80 people, it's not going to fall, not going to work. So I created for each scale a manifest variable factor score. And notice what I've done is I've correlated the factor score of scale 1 to the factor score of scale 2 on the residual. And then the factor two correlates with the fact, the, sorry, the time one, time two correlates with time three. I don't have time one correlated with time three because it's a repeated measure. And I've got three factors. This is the three, time one, time two, time three. It's the total score for these four factors, which are actually four latent scores. And then I've said, here's my Intercept and, intercept and slope. So 0 0.81, 0 0.89, 0 0.94. So what this is telling me is how you started has a small increase, but generally pretty constant influence on how you answer. Which basically kind of says, this experiment, this treatment, these are principals who had had a uh, program so the starting value didn't change very much across this program. The program wasn't changing very much. Their start value had a pretty constant influence. It wasn't a weak influence, it was reasonably strong. But over time, the time factor increases to being about equal with the um, start value. So how do I interpret this? The model, the factor model is pretty constant. And the start value has a pretty constant effect on them. And over time, there is a change effect over time. But it takes three times before it becomes almost as big as the start time. So if there is change, it's really slow and gradual. This is 18 months. Time one, time nine months later, 18 months later. So either it means the experiment, the treatment doesn't change things very much as far as how they understand leadership. It was a survey of leadership. 
So either it doesn't change very much, it, or the instrument isn't sensitive enough to detect the changes that were happening, which could explain why the people running this program no longer use this instrument. They've changed to a, they think, a better instrument. That this instrument wasn't actually detecting changes. And that's kind of what the model is saying. It also says, your start is negatively correlated with your change. So if you started high, you tended to stay high. You didn't change. If you started low, okay, maybe you tended to change. So maybe they just had a ceiling effect. <laughs> and they couldn't detect the upper range of changes that the people were actually making. Because those people who started at four and a half might have changed, but the scale couldn't measure that. And that's kind of what how you would have to diagnose this model and say, well, the new leaders might be pretty good before you even start your program, so maybe your program can't make them much better because they're already pretty good. It's not like you're starting with people who were bad leaders. This was a program for first-time school leaders, first-time school principals. And uh, we have a lot of them in New Zealand because we have lots of small schools. And so uh, there would be about 80 to 100 new school principals every year in New Zealand. Because um, we have over 2,000 schools for 5 million people. Lots of people live in the country with not many people around them. Here's another one. There are nine test, nine data points. We collected data from students. We asked them to complete a questionnaire about their emotions, about achievement. And we asked that, and we factor analyzed the battery of inventories into one, two, three, four, five different scales. And we conducted the data in the week before the midterm test, the week of the midterm test, and the week, two weeks later, when we gave them the scores on the midterm test. Because we were interested in how does assessment affect their emotions? And very little research had been published around emotions in the process of preparing for, doing, and getting your feedback. Most of this research is being done after or before, at one time point. Very little research has been done. And the, the longitudinal studies have been at the start of the year, at the end of the year, which is not very sensitive to emotional changes in a process. So we had students fill out this questionnaire Monday, Wednesday, Friday, before the, the week before the exam. Monday, Wednesday, the day of the exam, and Friday, two days after the exam, there's a midterm break of two weeks, and then they get their reports, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they got their reports on here. Yeah. So the question is, is this a line, in a straight line? It's a line, but is it a straight line? And everybody's head should go, no way, look at this. This might be a line, this might be a line, this might be a line, but it's a very unusual curve to try and model. And believe me, we tried quadratic, we tried cubic, and in the end we went, what if it's just line for week one, a line for week two, and a line for week three? And that's what we published in this study, is we published a latent curve, curve model that said, how did this emotions behave in week one, week two, week three? And it's, there's some interesting things from a substantial point of view. The positive emotions 
go down as they get closer to the test. Sounds normal, natural, and healthy to me. Oh God, I haven't studied enough. Uh, I, I, should, I shouldn't be so happy. I've got a test coming next week, right? And the negative emotions kind of creep up. Oh, oh, oh my goodness, I'm anxious, sad, and maybe I hate myself because I'm going to the bar when I should be at home studying, or I'm watching Netflix for the 13th time when I should be studying. You know, all those kind of things that people do. And then as soon as the test happens, the negative emotions, oh, thank God, I'm over. it's over. It wasn't so bad. I did okay. Or, okay. <laughs> now, at least now I know. And the positive emotions, yay, get a rebound effect. Yay, I'm happy now. It's over. Whew. Relief. And maybe even a sense of, yeah, that wasn't easy. That wasn't hard. I did that. I know those ends. I know those questions. I studied those ones. Yay, I got lucky. And then a couple of weeks later, suddenly I get my results. And maybe <laughs> my results are not as high as I want. Oh, shit, man, I'm bloody teachers. Or, oh, God, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> I have to start worrying. Right? So all of this seems perfectly explainable. And that's the kind of explanation we gave to the data. But let's look at the... Model. We also were interested in, is there any relationship between how you feel about things and your performance on this test, and we had access to their GPA that they came into the semester with. Either it was a GPA from high school or GPA from their previous year's study. So we wanted to know is there any relationship between your emotions and your performance, your emotions and your prior ability? So we actually extended the model from the classic latent curve model, but we added in GPA as a predictor. If you're smarter, maybe you are happier, your, your emotions are more positive, or yeah, or, and your GPA on your change, maybe if you're really good, you don't change very much, your emotions stay stable, or if you're low GPA, do your emotions bounce around? And of course, we expect GPA to be able to explain your test score, right? The people with higher GPA should have higher test scores. And of course, we want to know, does your emotion explain your test score? And does your changeability of emotion change your test score? And we used each emotion separately. We didn't try to do this as a multivariate set of emotions. We looked at the happiness emotion, the chilled emotion, and the, whoops, the happy, anxious, sad, and self-loathing. We looked at them separately because it was going to break our heads. And we only had 166 people, which means you're starting to get into estimation problems. And these, I'm giving you part of our data file. I'm giving you nine data for nine time points, and I'm giving you nine items for the time point. And these are the items. These come from Reinhard Peckron's work. He shares it, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that, that uh, his Achievement Emotions Questionnaire is a really nice instrument that covers four positive emotions and five negative emotions. Now, these emotions are sometimes activating and sometimes deactivating. Like, I felt relieved is a positive emotion, but people generally stop trying when they feel relieved. It's deactivating. Enjoyment might be, hey, that was good, but I don't necessarily try. Hopeful? you kind of motivated to try. Proud, you kind of want to keep trying. If you're hopeless, you probably give up trying. But if you're angry, you might, my mom and dad think I'm stupid, or my teacher just said I was stupid, I'm going to show them, right? And all the items were classified, scored between one and six using that. 
So what estimator do you recommend we should use? Sorry? Maximum likelihood could be okay, but you'd have to make an argument, and a lot of people go, no, 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 use WLS, because it's ordinal. But, but uh, it's six points. Yeah. yeah, it's at the point where you have to make an argument to the reviewer examiner that